Thank you, Sarah. Our next speaker is Sandeep Vekatram. Thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me to be here. Um, I'll be telling you about some of my thesis work studying the genotype fitness relationship for adaptive mutations. So as we all know, adaptive evolution is driven by the relationship between the genetic basis of adaptation, that is the specific mutations that occur, those effects on the phenotype of an organism, and those effects in turn on the fitness of the organism. This is exemplified by some work from the Hoekstra lab who've shown that mutations in the agouti and MC1R genes of these wild mice in, in, influence the coat color of these mice, which in turn influence their fitness because they have differential ability to camouflage themselves from predators. This relationship is of course dependent on the environment as well, as putting the same mice in an alternative environment drastically affects their fitness. For the, for the sake of simplicity, however, for the rest of this talk, I'll study the genotype fitness relationship directly. When we study this genotype fitness relationship for adaptive mutations, however, um, this particular example is essentially an example of adaptation in one trait in a handful of genes. And so we really want to know, if you want to understand evolution as this probabilistic process that it is, what are all of the other possible adaptive mutations that could have occurred that we didn't actually get to observe? These could be mutations in other genes that also influence coat color, or mutations in metabolism, or fertility, or other traits. Um, in particular, we're trying to understand whether these possible other adaptive mutations can be grouped into sort of similar genotypes or similar fitness effects as a way of better understanding the sort of evolutionary process and all of the sort of options available to it. To do this then, what we really need to do is ideally replay the tape of life, as Stephen Gould said, um, many times to get many independent adaptive events from the same starting point to ask what were all of the options available. This is clearly not really possible in a natural system, both for sort of the logistical problem of just taking the enormous undertaking of, of characterizing each adaptive mutation, as well as sort of our inability to sample all of these, as well as our inability to sample all of these events from a natural population. So to actually get around this problem, we study, uh, so we study adaptive evolution in a model system, that is microbial experimental evolution, where we can take a microbe, in our case Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and evolve it in the lab in a very defined condition in many replicates to be able to get many independent adaptive events. Um, the, there are, however, some technical limitations currently existing in sort of current microbial experimental evolution methods, which include sort of throughput issues in both um, conducting many replicate evolution experiments as well as in measuring fitness of all of these clones. Without sort of very specialized equipment, it's really hard to measure hundreds or thousands of adaptive events. Um, moreover, we also have a sequencing bias, since adaptive events are typically only identified by what we genotype at the end of whatever hundreds or thousands of generations of evolution. We might miss epigenetic events or events in sort of low complexity regions or repetitive sequences that we're not able to study otherwise. Finally, most, um, most approaches to studying sort of experimentally evolved populations sample these populations after hundreds or thousands of generations where they have five, 10, 20 or more mutations, which sort of precludes our ability to really isolate the effects of a single adaptive event and ask what its fitness consequences are as you're sort of seeing an aggregate over many mutations. And so to try and overcome these limitations, we developed um, a new system to try and sort of characterize many single adaptive events um, to study this sort of genotype fitness relationship. And the way that this works is instead of um, starting from a single ancestral clone for our evolution experiments, we're starting with an ancestral population of a half a million clones, which are otherwise identical with, with the exception of a DNA barcode. So this is just a random 20 nucleotide sequence that we've integrated into their genomes that can tag sort of specific subpopulations within a single evolving flask. What this does then is that we can now track the frequencies of these barcodes as a marker for any adaptive events that are occurring over the course of an evolution experiment over whatever, a couple hundred generations, simply by PCR amplifying out the barcodes and tracking them and then, and then estimating their frequencies by Illumina sequencing. What this does is this lets us estimate fitness in bulk. We can get 500,000 fitness estimates in a single experiment in a single assay. And so this is a level of power that we've never been able to achieve before. It also means that adaptive events that occur on unique barcodes must be independent simply because they, simply because they occurred on independent barcodes. And this lets us sample a large number of adaptive events potentially from a single, um, from a single evolution experiment. 
And as I mentioned, these experiments were conducted in the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It was published last year, so please check out the manuscript for further details. So we observe over 25,000 independent adaptive events within 200 generations of evolution in these, um, in these experiments. Uh, what I show here is, frequency is these frequency trajectory plots, where if you track the frequencies of these barcodes over the course of an evolution experiment, we have time on the x-axis and generations, and on the log scale and the y-axis, the number of cells estimated to be containing each barcode. Each line represents the frequency of one of these barcodes over the course of this evolution. The ones in red are the ones that we believe to be containing adaptive mutations based on these frequency trajectories, while the ones in blue are the ones that are neutral. And so this sort of forms our input to be able to systematically study this genotype fitness relationship because we have so many adaptive events that we can study um, in this system. So we went ahead and did just that. So we sampled this population of 4,800 clones to be precise from a time point where we believed and we later showed, and I won't have the time to go into the methods of it, um, to, to have single adaptive mutations. So this gets around the entire multiple mutations problem I was alluding to earlier. We then developed additional methods, which I won't go into here, to measure the fitness of all of these clones, again, in a single pooled assay. So we're doing 5,000 fitness measurements in one flask, and we can do this many, many times to get sort of very precise estimates. Um, so from here, then, we get a fitness distribution, right, of all of the adaptive events that are occurring, or at least a fairly good sample of them, that hopefully are, is sort of a fairly comprehensive understanding of what's going on. So this fitness distribution, surprisingly, is bimodal, which is fairly unusual from the sort of exponential models that are typically used in pop gen theory. And so we see many clones with zero fitness, that is, they're essentially neutral. Um, we expect sort of a good chunk of this population to be neutral from our sample, so that's not too unexpected. But there are also many clones with fitness of around 0 0.25, um, as well as sort of a long tail of fitness effects between 0 0.4 and 1.25. So we were very curious as to what the genetic basis of adaptation was for all of these different mutation classes. Since we have individual clones corresponding to each of these fitness estimates in our freezer, we can just pick them out and find things for sequencing. And so we ended up doing whole genome sequencing on 350 of these adaptive clones to, to actually find the genetic basis of adaptation. So what do we find? We find two major classes of what we later show to be adaptive mutations. We started our evolution experiments with a haploid ancestor, and very surprisingly, many of them actually essentially duplicated their genomes to become diploid. Um, this was something like 250 of the 350 clones that we ended up sequencing, and it turned out to be diploid. The other class was um, haploid clones which had mutations in what we call the nutrient response pathways, that is the RAS PKA or TOR SCH9 pathways, which are essentially responsible for controlling the growth of these organisms um, under, um, in, in, in response to their glucose availability. We're actually evolving these clones, um, these populations in glucose-limited media, and people have seen mutations in these pathways before, so this was a fairly expected result. However, we have 80-something clones with independent mutations in those pathways, so we can actually do statistics on their fitness distributions that have never been possible before. So now that we have a large number of clones that we've genotyped, as well as these sort of comprehensive fitness distributions of these single adaptive clones, we can try and see how these distributions relate to each other. And so we can begin by sort of first looking at the fitness effects of diploidy. So diploidy here turns out to be adaptive, and it actually is almost entirely responsible for that second peak of 0 0.25 fitness that we observed. Um, in contrast, these are the various genes in the nutrient response pathways. I won't go into them in too much detail, but they're actually responsible for that long tail of 0 0.4 to 1.25 fitness. Um, moreover, we see sort of systematic quantitative differences in the fitness effects of mutations, not just between diploidy and nutrient response pathway, but even between different genes in the nutrient response pathway down to paralogs. For example, IRA1 genes have higher fitness effect than IRA2 genes, and even down to mutation type, where missense events in IRA1 are significantly less fit than nonsense and, and insertion deletion events in the same gene. So despite the apparent simplicity of the genetic basis of adaptation, there's quantitative fitness differences going on here. Overall, these two classes actually explain the fitness effects of 95% of the clones that we ended up sequencing. There's only 14 clones that we know to be adaptive that don't have mutations in one of these two classes, but since we know that they are adaptive, we can go back, and this is some of our future directions, to try and identify what is actually going on in them, because we have these fitness estimates saying that there has to be something in there. <laughs> 
So the other way we can study this genotype fitness relationship is actually in the other direction, asking whether clones with similar fitness effects have similar genetic bases of adaptation. This might give us some additional insight into whether clones have sort of similar physiological effects. Maybe mutations in different genes are doing similar things, and so they'll be sh showing similar fitness effects. However, with a single fitness estimate in a single environment, we don't have great power to do this, and so we measured the fitness of all 4,800 clones in nine different conditions, and then performed essentially principal components analysis to ask whether clones with similar fitness across all of these conditions have similar genetic bases of adaptation. So this plot is a little bit busy, so I'll walk you through it. This is essentially a principal components decomposition of a subset of our 4,800 clones, most of them which both of which we had sequenced. These two principal components actually explain 90% of the variance in our nine different um, condition fitness estimates, so suggesting that this decomposition is a good way of representing the data. Each point represents the fitness effect, essentially, of one of these clones across all conditions, um, re reduced onto these two components. Um, points, that are close to, points that are close to each other are clones with very similar fitness effects across all conditions, and those that are distant from each other are very different. Um, they're color-coded by their genetic basis of adaptation. So you can see that, for example, over here, there are IR1 genes with nonsense or, or insertion deletion events, which appear to be doing very distinct things physiologically from the rest of our mutations that we observe. In contrast, over here, we have mutations in GPB2, IRA2, PDE2, and a number of other genes which seem to be clustering very tightly, suggesting that mutations, even though they're even though they are in different genes, are doing very similar things to the cell. Um, these others here are mostly con um, consisting of diploid clones, suggesting that they are, again, sort of a fairly distinct class. So in conclusion, we've developed an extremely powerful system to sort of systematically study this genotype fitness relationship. And this is a system that we can apply to alternative genotypes, to alternative environments, to ask questions about epistasis and pleiotropy. Um, but more than that, just here, right, we're able to see sort of quantitative fitness differences um, both at the gene level and even at the mutation type level, and then use these fitness estimates to recapitulate differences and similarities in the genetic basis of adaptation. So we hope that this proves to be a powerful system for studying adaptive evolution in the future. With that, I'd like to thank my many, many collaborators and funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. That's really beautiful. So I, I have a question about your diploids. Do they show up faster or at the same time all over the whole time course? So that is a very interesting question, actually. And so what ends up happening is that um, the diploidy appears to initially arise by transformation mutagenesis, essentially. So they're almost present as soon as the evolution experiment starts. And we've done some other assays to show that that's probably what's going on. However, because they're so low fitness, the, the, the clones with the nutrient response pathways end up taking over by generation 150 or so, but then they start diploidizing themselves. And so the diploid frequency sort of goes down and it goes back up later on. And so we're trying to do some more work trying to study the, the dynamics of that long term. So, so once they have one of those point mutations that the nutrient point mutations that yes. give them better fitness, if they diploidize, do they get even increased fitness over that? We haven't directly tested it, but given that the diploid frequency does increase, my suspicion is yes. Um, many of these nutrient response pathway mutations are actually loss of function events, so it sort of makes sense that you have to get that first before you diploidize because it would probably be recessive if it occurred on a diploid background. And so we think that it sort of makes sense given the biology of what's going on, but we have to test that uh, formally. Okay, very cool, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.